Hello, my name is Rebecca Tapp. Welcome to season two of the Decoding Purpose podcast, The Turning Point. In this season of the Decoding Purpose podcast, our intention is clear to decode the turning points that catalyze purpose so we can empower conscious choice over crisis and ignite conversations that change the world. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. Now, when I first discovered today's guest a few months ago, I was actually attracted to the title of his book. Now, I know that might sound a little bit strange, but a friend of mine had actually shared the book title on LinkedIn, and along with the funky Bowie-style graphics, the words of the title, The Soulful Art of Persuasion, really jumped off the page at me. See, before that day, I'd not really considered that persuasion could in fact be soulful. Well, I hadn't thought about it consciously anyway. And that is why I loved the title of this book, because it brought an intention to the idea that influence could in fact have integrity, that purpose could be something that led to profit and that being a good entrepreneur, influencer or salesperson, whatever it is, can just start with being a good human. See, persuasion does not need to be power over when it can be built upon a foundation of empowerment. And these are all the reasons why today's guest, Jason Harris, was a special one for me and an interview I was incredibly honoured to host. So who is Jason Harris, you may ask? Now, Jason is the CEO and president of one of the world's fastest growing and most successful creative agencies based out of New York City, Mechanism. As the author of The Soulful Art of Persuasion, Jason believes that genuine persuasion in the 21st century is all about developing character rather than relying on the easy tactics of flattery, manipulation and short-term gain. It's about engaging rather than insisting and listening versus exploiting. It is about developing empathy and communicating your values. Most importantly, it's about winning others over to your point of view by understanding their needs rather than focusing on the pursuit of self-centred goals. So in today's podcast, we spoke about all of these themes, but we also spoke about them through a brand new lens, and that's the lens of COVID-19. Now, I don't think any of us can predict what will happen next or how the world will change in these unprecedented times. But the one thing I do know is that anything that highlights the significance of the soul and celebrates what it is to be a good human being, a purpose-driven human being, that that is exactly what we need to focus on next. That's the kind of persuasion that will give us a sense of meaning and that will give us a sense of certainty when the world is completely uncertain. So with that in mind, welcome to the podcast, Jason Harris. Jason Harris, it's so great to have you on the show with me uh, for Decoding Purpose. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So, Jason, I'm going to kick off with a question that I actually ask every single guest on the show, and I think uh, you'll probably agree it's a fairly soulful way to get started. So the question is this, do you think that the pursuit for purpose in life is an intentional decision or is it a kind of destiny or fate? Uh, Intentional uh, pursuit of purpose in life? Yes. Um. You know, I think it comes to people in different ways. I think it can be intentional. And I think, you know, in my, in my situation, um, in, in finding sort of a, a larger uh, purpose and, and using skills to do social good or something good in the world um, came to me sort of, it happened upon me. So I think it can happen in, in different ways to people. Mm-hmm. Um, you might not know what that purpose is even until you're presented with the opportunity. 
Well, um, the beautiful thing for me about today's conversation is that we're going to be unlocking a, a few of the habits that you have spoken about in your book, The Soulful Art of Persuasion. And what I loved about it, and one of the reasons I wanted to interview you, is that I think some of the habits you spoke about are also uh, ways that I believe we can tap into our purpose and, and start to lean into the more soulful parts of, of who we are and how we connect with meaning in our lives. So I'm excited to jump in. Perfect. So, Jason, as as we were just discussing uh, before the show, right now the entire world is is going through such a critical time in dealing with the COVID nineteen crisis. And as a New New Yorker, you're right there in the epicenter. So, before moving on, I just wanted to check in. How are you, your family, and your friends holding up at at this point in time? Uh, we're we're doing well. You know, it's um, I, I run a an, an advertising agency with about two hundred people. And so changing the um, frame of reference, we're in a very creative, uh, collective, collaborative um, practice. And when you're not doing things like having, uh, you know, jam sessions in person, looking at ideas together, having brainstorms, it, it took a minute from a work perspective to switch gears into connecting with people um, remotely and over video to actually crack um, creative ideas. So that part uh, took a while. Um, you know, f- family-wise and personally, it's been it's been okay. I mean, there's there's still you can still go to grocery stores like everywhere in the world. You can still figure mm-hmm. out a way to you know get your get food done. Um, but it's uh, it, it created a bit of anxiety for everyone and paralysis when you're not sure uh, what to do. But I think the, you know, in my little community and then in the larger community, I think people adapted rather quickly and followed the rules and they're being, you know, super cautious, which I think is good. It just really is incredible how how fast the world had to change. Mm. Um, it's really been been really crazy to see. Yeah, it's, um, it's been amazing you know? seeing that level of adaption so quickly. Yeah. True. It's, 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 been, it's been powerful, though, to see, I think, even when everyone's so apart, how we can all still figure out ways to connect, um, even if not physically. So, Jason, this year I I actually made a decision to theme the Decoding Purpose podcast around turning points um, because on on the note of what we were just talking about, I believe that whether these turning points are personal, professional or global, such as the current pandemic, it's kind of in these sliding door moments that life... um, dishes out, whether those events are by choice or by crisis, like the one we're dealing with at the moment, that when we deal with these turning point moments, we start to peel away the layers of our identity to discover the more soulful or purpose-driven parts of who we are. Now, you, I'm I'm sure, have had a few turning points over your lifetime, but is there one moment that really stands out for you as a defining moment that influenced who you are today? Yeah. And, and, you know, there's several throughout my, um, my, my life, of course, like everyone can remember those key turning point moments, but the sort of the most recent, and, you know, purpose, when we talk about purpose and, and purpose driven influence, the sort of biggest one for me happened in, um, 2014 when I, was um, invited. My agency um, has done a lot of work for uh, various brands. And we did one uh, campaign for um, a body spray called Axe. Are you familiar with Axe? I forget what they call it in Australia. They might call it something else. I'm not familiar with it, but um, I'll have to check it out. Hey. Yeah, there's a Unilever (laughs) brand. I know it's called something else uh, in Australia. But it really, um, because of that work, it was really targeting college men using this body spray to attract women. And we had done a lot of work targeting college age men, my agency had. And um, Vice President Biden and President Obama um, were looking to create a campaign to stop sexual assault on college campuses, and which is, which is really rampant. Uh, about one mm. in five 
women are sexually assaulted. So, you know, it's 20%. So it's, it's incredibly high. And they wanted to find a firm that understood how to talk to college guys because the campaign was going to be about connecting with college men, not the, the, 5% of men that commit those those crimes but the 95% of men who don't stop them and and don't get involved. And so because we had done work on one brand that was targeted at college age men trying to attract women, they thought we could use some of those same skills to create this social good campaign um to help um the college students understand um how, you know, painful and 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 horrible sexual assaults can be. And so we created this campaign called It's On Us, which is still running now. And it's, there's about 500 chapters all across uh, the U.S. on college campuses. It's, it's really changed a lot of legislation um, for how sexual assaults are, are reported. And so it was wildly uh, successful. But that was thrust upon me because um, Vice President Biden and his team called me in because of our agency's work and asked us to do a social good campaign to help protect women on college campuses, it wasn't something I was seeking out. It was thrust upon me. It came to you. Yeah. It came to me. And and of course I said yes and took that on, uh, that challenge on, and we created a a really uh, successful campaign, which then led me to create what's called the uh, Creative Alliance, which is now a hundred companies that are doing uh, social good purpose-driven advertising. So it's using our advertising powers uh, to put some good in the world. And there's over a hundred companies doing that because that one thing that was thrust on me turned into a, a whole other nonprofit uh, that I founded in order to do social good work because I never knew I would have never have done it myself until I was asked to do it. And once I was asked to do it, it opened up my mind into what, how my purpose could evolve. And then I can use my powers uh, to do some good, but I never would have thought of that on my own. It wouldn't have come to me uh, um, just because I wanted to go seek that out. Mm. It came to me because I was asked to do something. I was called to service. And that was sort of one of those moments for me that, you know, has changed a lot of my purpose and what I do in life. Yeah. Look, I love that. And it, it sits right in that first question of whether purpose is a choice or whether purpose is destiny, because that one certainly landed in your lap. Jason, I have a question about that. A lot of my listeners out there um, are, you know, maybe listening to this podcast because they're looking to get clear on their purpose. But I think the thing is uh, with purpose is without influence, it's just an idea. And what you're talking about there is taking an idea that can change the world and literally giving it wings so that that message can transform into a movement. I'm just wondering, and this might be a big question, but if you could crystallise it, what are the steps to take a message into a movement? Um, that's a that's a great question. I, I can I can crystallise it um, pretty pretty succinctly. I think first it has to start with. Um, It has to be simple. So whatever that purpose is, whatever you're driven to do, you have to make sure that it's clear and simple. And it's just, it's almost like any branding you would do in in the marketing world. Um, You got to simplify and crystallize it. And it has to be uh, very, very clear. It can't, you can't pig pile a bunch of um, interconnected ideas or thoughts onto it. So I think simplifying it um, has to be the first step. And the second step, um, is, is being, um, consistent with it. So when you know what, what that is and you want to get a message out there in the world, or you want to do a certain act, make sure it's simple, be super consistent with how you tell that story, how you get it out in the world. I mean, a good example is, is your, your podcast has a very clear, you know, it's, it's two words. You break down exactly what it is. And that's what that's what your your goal is mm-hmm. is to really look at everything through the lens of purpose and what makes people purpose driven and try to break that down. That's a good example of of clarity. It's not um, you don't try to talk about a million other things within that uh, scope. You really keep it super defined. And so simplifying it, being consistent with it, and then um, the last part is is about community. And so if you're if you've got your idea. 
and you know how you're going to talk about it. You know different ways to communicate about it. You're consistent with it. The last is community, and community is all about trying um, whatever your lane is, trying to find influential people, people that are in your orbit, people that are connected to the topic that you care about, and build that community. And when you build that community, that's when you start to have uh, momentum. You start to create this movement mm. because you're, it's, it's shared. You can't do it on your own. You have to lean into those others that are going to, to help carry the message or that are touching your message in some way and you know, cultivating that community. And that, that takes years and years and years, but that's how you'll create something that's super powerful. So when I did uh, one campaign, it could have just been one campaign and that's it. But because I was clear on the purpose, which is, you know, using my advertising powers for good, mm -hmm. simple, clear, I was consistent about doing that. I then recruited other companies to do the same thing with that clear message and trying to get them to join this idea of doing the same thing they do for brands that they're paid for, but doing it for social good, uh, for no money, but doing it because it's good for the soul. And um, when, when I built that community, everything started to snow, uh, snowball because you didn't have one company doing it or one person talking about it. Mm, the had, power is amplified. You know, power is amplified. Mm, and that's, mm. that's the way you build something that um, is long lasting and isn't, isn't one and done. Yeah, awesome. So I'm just going to loop that for my listeners. From, from what I heard there, we have clarity of purpose, so keeping it simple. We have contribution. We have consistency, so consistently showing up for that message. And then from there, building a community around that message and the combination of those things will catalyze the movement. That's exactly right. I think I did an okay job of that. You I'm trying to take notes you myself. <laughs> yeah. you, de you decoded it perfectly. Perfect. Nice. Yeah. So look, what I'd love to, to have a chat about now is is looking at, you know, you've had, say, the last two decades, you've been at the forefront of the advertising industry. And in that time, the world has really been flipped upside down by digitisation. And that's led to an economy of attention, especially in the world of ads. And in addition to that, there is an abundance of information, but that also means there's a lot of junk information leading to distrust. So, in your opinion, what are the links between these trends that have emerged and how influence has evolved to something that's more soulful than it ever was? Right. That's a, that's a great, that's a great uh, thing to spring off of. The, I think the, the time that we live in now, um, and you, you mentioned it with the, the attention, um, we do live in an, in an age of distrust where we, you know, there's everything from from fake news, you know, you're covering up the camera on your computer. <laughs> you think Alexa and Google are listening into every conversation. There's phishing scams online. Um, you don't know what Facebook's doing with your data. So we're, we're living in this hyper-connected, you know, digital world where it breeds so much distrust that we end up sort of um, being on, or like our bullshit detectors are very high and mm. we're afraid. Uh, that everyone is sort of out for us in, in some way, shape, or form, or they're using our information or data or you know, trying to steal it or uh, leverage it. And I think living in that time, there's, there's this time, there's never been a better time for a soulful, authentic um, personality or brand or whatever your listeners might be trying to accomplish. That is the thing that um, cuts through. If you are building trust and you're authentic and you're sticking to your word and you're not over promising and you're delivering or over delivering on the things that you commit to over time, those relationships will build and compound on themselves because that is not the world we live in. You know, we're living in a transactional, um, get, get, um, rich and famous as fast as you can do whatever it takes to get it done, build, build, build. Mm. And if you can counter that with playing the long game and looking out for long-term relationships that are built on trust, you're going to leapfrog in the end. You're, you know, it's a business and, you know, personal relationships. It's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So if you can 
if you can go against um, and stand out by being authentic and building those relationships, not thinking in transactional terms of I do this for you, you do this for me, that in the end is going to make you a much more influential person because you're going to stand out from the, the sort of way the world's moving at the moment. Absolutely. And look, I'm going to jump around with my questions a little bit here, but since yeah, you just, since you just fun, yeah. mentioned the long game, that is something when I was looking through your book, it's something that really stood out for me in the context of what we're all dealing with, with COVID-19 and the pivot that we've had to make uh, in business. And I wanted to ask you, do you think that entrepreneurs, leaders and influencers should really be taking this long game approach in navigating this current crisis? Yeah, definitely. I think this, the, what we're living in now is all about playing the long game. It's about, you know, what, we, you know, we recently wrote a, a white paper on how to sort of, it, it's, it's targeting brands, but it can be targeting entrepreneurs as well. And it's basically a sort of a playbook of how to go through um, the, the, the time that we're living in and the, the principles that will make you successful um, right now. And, and, and really what we're living through is a perfect time to play the long game. Mm. And, you know, certainly there's, there's businesses that are, um, they might not have that um, ability, right? Because they're either on the, on the fringe of, of, you know, falling apart or they might be, um, go, you know, going out of business or so close to, to going out of business that, that they don't really have that luxury. But I think for, for the most, most part, we have um, a, a way for us to really um, be successful and, and play the long game. And, and you know, some of those things are, um, you know, if you're fortunate enough, like one example is if you're fortunate enough now to do something that helps, you should be doing some something that helps. You should mm. be taking an action that can, you know, help people. It could be, you know, sharing vital information. It could be engaging in an act of generosity, like donating something to those in need. Um, that's one action you can be taking. You know, you can always be thinking of the way you're communicating to your audience and putting it in providing contextual value, putting it in the the time and, and and message of what we're dealing with mm. now um you can be you know really rethinking your purpose if you're an entrepreneur why does your brand exist in the world what is the purpose of it it's times to rethink that um it's not trying to just um go after sales and try to make sales calls during this time mm. to get as much money or to jump on uh, the problems that people might be have or the stress that people have or the anxiety. It's really about building a brand in the long game. And there was a recent study that said that companies that uh, did this most recently in the 2008-2009 recession were way far ahead when, the, when the, the economy came back and we were out of that recession because they built trust with their audience, they built trust with, um, their, with the consumer during this time. And, you know, it's not a time to curl up in a ball and be silent. And it's also not a time to take advantage. Mm. It's a real time to go back to the basics of why your company or your brand exists in the world and what can your brand or, or company do um, that can be um, helpful. What can you be doing? What actions can you take that can be useful mm. during this time? And it's, I mean, it's such a good time to do it. I as a part of this podcast, have, have done a COVID-19 special, which is around how you navigate the, the pandemic purposefully. And I interviewed a mutual friend of ours, Julie Masters, and I know you were on her podcast, Inside oh, Influence, yeah, a, a few weeks she's ago. A, yeah, she's great. She is great. And one of the things she said is in terms of influence, right now is one of the best times to really take a risk and get your purpose out there purely because in struggle we have as a community come together and within that we're no longer after perfect. We're actually looking 
for people just to keep it real and to connect with us. And so it's a great time if you're looking to step into influence to take a bigger risk and to put yourself out there because people are so much more open around uh, really wanting to receive the more soulful aspects of who a person is and and sort of throwing that idea of perfect influence um, out of the way at the moment. Yeah, I love that. That's so, so, so great. Uh, it's so perfect. It's spot on for what we're living through right now. Mm. I think, um, you know, showing, showing, uh, I always call it showing a little psychic skin. Yeah. You know, letting people see um, the real you and, you know, with all your flaws and vulnerabilities and thoughts, but your personal idiosyncrasies, you really should be wearing them on your sleeve right now. I think it's more important than ever. Mm. Yeah. So I want to chat more about the book, The Soulful Art of Influence. And in the book, you decode the 11 habits to master influence, which sit in in four key areas, being what it is to be original, to be generous, to be empathetic, and to be soulful. And as I said before, what I love about these areas is that from my perspective, some parts of soulful influence, I think, also provide gateways to step into the discovery of our life purpose. So So let's start with what it means to be original. In the book, one of the terms you used to describe that was all about turning to face the strange, which I loved. As a starting point, can you explain for our listeners what you actually mean by facing the strange? Yeah, sure. I can, I can definitely do that. And I, that was obviously ripped off from uh, one of my idols, David Bowie, um, who, you know, I always tell the, the story of of David Bowie when he was a recording artist and he first started his career, he was asked to make music that was just like Bob Dylan, which was, you know, folk music at the time was really popular. And so instead of being himself, he um, adopted his musical style to what the record label thought the audience was wanting to hear at the time. And his, those records never sold anything and they never went anywhere. And then he went on a sort of sojourn and lived in a monastery. He studied, um, he studied mime. He, you know, did some, some acting in plays. He really went out and kind of discovered who he was, which then influenced the characters that he created and the music that he made. But he did that by realizing that he had to really know himself and he had to be an original if his musical career was ever going to take off. And so I love that line because it encapsulates looking inward and really understanding what makes you tick, Mm. your, your idiosyncrasies, who your role models are, role models are, what you draw inspiration from, what makes you unique, what your core values are. It's really all about, you know, to sum it up, it's all about being yourself and, to be yourself, you have to really know yourself and you have to, once you know yourself, then you can show that to the world. And, and that to me is, is all about being original. I think we all have that story of when we were trying to conform or we were trying to hang out with a certain group of people, or we were trying to model ourselves after what we thought we should become. And that's a real quick recipe for not to not to be successful because what people are really craving is to really understand who you are and for you to show that to the world and in all your you know vulnerabilities and highs and lows and the more you can do that uh the 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 farther ahead you're going to be and to me that's really what being original is all about mm. And look, you just mentioned vulnerability and the flip side of vulnerability is, is courage because the one thing... I love that. Yeah. Well, when I, th- when I think about really what it means to be an original, it, you really need to be able to let go of, of judgment, primarily judgment over yourself in, in fully expressing who you are. What was your experience of that? I mean, in, in stepping into your level of originality, do you remember moments where you're like, mm, I don't know, don't know if I can be that. That's a little bit weird. What are they <laughs> going to think about that one? <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, I, 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 I still, I still think I have those that I always have to fight against and and be, you know, be sort of mindful of. And you know, I, I think about, I don't know why I, I read about this in the book, and it's 
it's kind of a, a pretty base example. But when I was, uh, I started my agency in, in San Francisco, which is near Napa Valley in the U.S., which is wine country. And um, everyone in that area was, you know, always talking about wines and grapes and different uh, variants and how they tasted and all the aromas. And I, I pretended for a, a minute to really also be into wine. So if I went out to dinner with a client, I could impress them with my knowledge. Or if I um, was socializing with a group of friends, I, I could kind of, uh, play the part of a, a wine snob and then I realized that I don't even freaking like wine <laughs> like I don't like really like how it tastes yeah I don't like the way it makes me feel I don't like how it turns my teeth purple and um, so then I ever since then I just never I've never um, had wine since and I know a lot of your listeners probably love wine and think that's crazy but for me that's an example of me trying to um, uh, play the part of my region and where I live because I thought it would sort of get me ahead in business or I would impress uh, friends socially. And now I can tell, have a story to tell about why, you know, that I don't like wine and here's the reason why. And I pretended to like wine so I can be vulnerable about me trying uh, to uh, be something I wasn't. And it's a much better and richer story than uh, pretending that I, I know something about uh, an area that I don't care about. Yeah. And I think it's, it's an example like that of knowing um, really who you are, what you like and what you don't like versus trying to model uh, yourself for, you know, thinking that people are going to care. So once we've sort of got comfortable with, with facing and owning our strange, I imagine in terms of influence from there, we need to form a narrative. So a story that firstly we tell ourselves. So why do we show up? What, what story do we tell ourselves about who we are in the world? And then what story do we tell the world? So I have two questions for you. For you. The first one is a personal question and, and that is, what story for you gets you out of bed? What ignites you to show up for yourself and for your purpose in the world? What what particular story gets me out of bed? Yeah. Oof. I know it's a big um, one. That's a big one. I yeah. mean, uh, I think, you know, it's, it's hard to uh, uh, explain, but I like right now the story, the current story that really – you know, gets me out of bed is, is this idea of, um, you know, I've, I've created this, this sort of method, the soulful art of persuasion in this book. And to me, it really, you know, part of the, the reason why I wrote this book and it took me three years was because I would read so many self-help books or business books. And I think a lot of what they contained is really is bullshit and it's about sort of mirror and matching the audience. It's about some of the things that we've, we've already talked about that I really don't subscribe to. And I mm -hmm. think it's, it's, it's bad medicine for the world and it's bad for people to try to think that if they aren't, you know, true to themselves or play the long game, that they're just going to quickly get ahead and accelerate um, by sort of creating a false narrative about themselves um, to get other people to like them, therefore to get more money and be more successful. And so for me, what's currently getting me out of bed is telling this story of these principles, which I've really broken down from a career of 25 years that I find to be really successful that aren't really, they're being told in pockets, but they're not really uh, put together. So I'm kind of jazzed right now about getting this uh, more into mm. the world and trying to uh, help people, you know, become the, their most successful version of themselves and as influential as they can. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, I, I personally worked in the professional speaking and thought leadership space for the last 15 years. And I have really seen that shift from this concept of having power over someone in influence to this philosophy that you're talking about, which is actually around the empowerment of a human being in how we influence them. Um, and it's such a refreshing perspective. Yeah, I like that. That's really, that's really well said. It is, 
it is a it, you know I think the old the old school thinking was this way of how do you get power over someone mm -hmm. and there's tools and tricks you can learn to do that versus um, em empowering and building relationships by showing people who you really are and working on those relationships, creating generosity, um, becoming an empathetic person. These are also things you can learn. These are, you know, some of the habits in the book will come natural to people, but by definition, a habit is something that you can practice over and over so that it becomes second mm. nature. And uh, you can learn, like I'm not a naturally generous person. I wasn't born that way. I had to learn to become that way because that's, that's what I, uh, you know, I realized like I want to be like that and I can learn to be like that and I can habitually, um, you know, but through practice it can become habitual behavior and now I'm sort of an, I'm I'm naturally a generous person mm. because I worked on it. Yeah, um, it's like getting yeah. on the yoga mat of influence. You got to practice every day. <laughs> <laughs> yoga mat. Yeah, yeah. You're going to be very inflexible at the beginning, and then by the end, you'll be doing poses you never thought you could. So look, Jace, you, you just spoke about generosity and I know it really is a big part of your philosophy uh, in becoming a soulful influencer. So what is it about generosity that makes it one of the most powerful currencies, not only in the world of influence, but just in the world of being a good human? Well, I think the idea, um, you know, I have this philosophy of give something away in every interaction. So mm. when you cross paths with with people and obviously there'll be people in the world you don't feel like being generous for whatever reason or their their vibe doesn't fit you but in general your goal should be to leave try to leave people a little bit better off than they were before they interacted with you and so giving something away can be it can be time it can be advice it can be information it can be an article that you know you think might resonate with them it can be a book it can be a gift it can it can come in a lot of different forms it's not just buying something for someone but it's really trying to be a generous person and practice this idea of what what am i giving what value am i giving to someone in every interaction and it's not because i'm expecting something in return it's a way of thinking where you're naturally just doing that and then things will ultimately come back your way with compound interest. And it's not something you can measure on a one-to-one -one basis, but it's a behavior and a way of thinking about interacting with people that will, uh, will it'll bring you a lot of joy, but it'll also bring you a lot of success. Mm. So, <clears throat> Jason, in a conversation about purpose or having a sense of purpose, I think empathy is really what drives that energy in motion. You know, I don't think we can really even have a purpose without having some level of empathy for another person. Now, at the heart of empathy are qualities that seem simple, but in some ways they're quite complex. And those things that we need to practice include deep listening and non-judgment or what the Buddhists refer to as loving kindness. So where do we begin if we are someone looking to expand our level of empathy? Um, so I think if you're trying to become more empathetic, which I would argue is a really critical um, sort of principle for success, I think one, you know, there's sort of basically three main ways I think about empathy and the first one is to um, develop a natural curiosity about others and listen and learn more than you judge you know try to make it about the other person um, and I think that is a way to open your mind where you're not trying to either just get your way or get them to see your point of view but you're really trying to connect on a human level and this is this, this is something I, I, I talked about on um, with Julie, but mm. the idea that humans are 99.9% .9 the same. So there's only 0.1% of our DNA that make us all different. But we think of ourselves as so sort of bifurcated or different or whatever our belief or political party is or religion. We think of ourselves as so unique and so different and it's hard 
from that philosophy to um, be a, an empathetic person, but if you understand how similar we are as people. And I think the interesting thing about the time we're living in now is it's showing how interconnected the world is, mm. which was forced upon us, but it really does glaringly show that it is a small world mm. and that we are all connected and that that is really an interesting um, a point of view it really highlights this idea of um, you know making it about them thinking about other people seeking out collaborations seeing the commonalities and not the differences between us totally. and I think that's really what makes um, an empathetic uh, person which I think is a is a, a learned behavior and a way of approaching other people that isn't how do I convince them that I'm right or get them over to my point of view but by understanding other people, you do become more influential yourself. Mm. And and do you have any tips around the deep listening component? Because I imagine working in in advertising, listening is is a big part of that skill. Yeah, I mean the 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 sort of broad idea behind that is that really listening by thinking about the other person, not listening by trying to pick up what you want to hear to get your point across you know mm. like put, yeah they're two, di two it, different hearing and listening are two different things in that sense they're, that's right yeah. they're really different ways of thinking and it's um it's a it's a different mindset i can't i can't explain it except that when you're you know when you're listening when you're hearing it's it's a it's a different way, but you can't be an empathetic person without flipping your viewpoint um, to the other side. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I don't I don't have a particular um, note on that of of how I, it's just um, you know that filter of what can I pick apart from what they're saying mm. to get across to get what to get a win. Mm. It's more what can I really listen to and understand what they're saying and the reason why that can help you unfold the conversation. Mm. And, and again, I think it comes back to playing the long game because if you're really, really listening, you're actually holding a space for that person's full experience opposed to looking for the transaction where you need specific information to get what you need. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So look, it's actually, um, it's Good Friday here in Australia, which makes it quite a fitting day to talk about the discovery of your personal Jesus. So <laughs> what, what can we learn about the art of inspiration from, from JC or, or whoever, whoever the God is of your understanding? I love that. Um, you know, I always forget it's Friday. It's Friday already. It's Friday here, yeah. Yeah, I'm still yeah. living in Thursday. You're in Thursday. I always forget. Yeah, both are true. <laughs> but both are true, oddly yeah. enough. Um, yeah, so personal Jesus to me is really all about whatever, you know, finding your soul is whatever your belief is, whatever your personal brand pillars are, whatever those, um, you know, passions and belief that's going to define your life. That to me is what, you know, personal Jesus means. It's um, developing um, a soulful life, a purpose-based life that comes down, you know, kind of as a circle. It goes back to the original principle of, of being original and being yourself. And then in defining that, it's about hunting uh, out skills and l learning to develop those passions that support your brand uh, values, your brand pillars. And to me, that's, that's where the soulfulness comes in. Um, and, and then after the personal Jesus part is once you've kind of figured out that soulful piece or that purpose piece, as you would call it, mm. it's how do you take that and then inspire other people with it? How do you act in that way that becomes inspirational? And it's not preachy. It might have, you know, the Jesus idea in there, mm. but it's about taking your soulful purpose based activity to inspire other people to either find theirs or join in whatever your thing might be. Um, but it's, it's about um, developing yourself into uh, an inspirational uh, practice. Um, that's really what it's about. It's, it's becoming an inspiration. 
Well, look, does I that th- make sense? That makes perfect sense. And and I think it's, it's probably a good spot to bookmark today's conversation because I have to say you, in every sense of the word, are such an inspiration. And I have felt truly honoured to, to have um, the time with you to interview you about the art of soulful influence, particularly at this point uh, in human history when I think one of the things that is is really going to enable us to to help another human, to heal another human, or to build hope for another human is the art of being soulful. So thank you for living your purpose, Jason Harris. We um well, we appreciate, appreciate you that. and need you so much in the world right now. Well, thank you for uh, helping everyone decode uh, their purpose and break it down for people. You're absolutely welcome, and and hopefully we can chat again when you release uh, another book in the future, which I'm sure you will. You've got so much gold there. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> where can we uh, Where right. can we visit your digital homes since we're doing digital visits at this point in time? Sure. Yeah, I have a website, thesoulfulart.com, and then I'm on you know all the social media channels um, at Jason underscore Harris. You can see me there on Twitter, Instagram. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Excellent. Thank you for joining me on Decoding Purpose, Jason Harris. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>